Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. Today, I'd like to continue my mini-series on game theory. Last time, we started exploring the nimbers as they arise from games. And if you haven't seen that video, this one won't make much sense, so go watch that first. Today, we're going to study the nimbers as an algebraic structure. In the last video, we talked about adding nimbers, which came from playing two games at the same time. And we noted that subtraction was the same thing as addition. We also saw that we could multiply nimbers by playing a two-dimensional analog of nim. And once we've defined addition, subtraction, and multiplication, we have what the algebraists call a ring. And that lets us use all the tools of algebra to study the numbers. But it's not just a ring. We can divide numbers, which makes it a field. And it's not just a field. We can take square roots. And once we throw in transfinite ordinals, we can even solve polynomials, which makes the numbers an algebraically closed field. That's a lot of beautiful structure hiding just beneath the surface. Let's dive in and see. A natural question we might ask, if we have multiplication, is whether there's division, too. That is, if we have two numbers, a and b, is there some number x so that a equals bx? And it turns out the answer is yes. We can always divide two numbers. To see why, let's look at our multiplication table. Notice that in every row and every column, except the zeroth, we see each number from 0 to 15 exactly once. And similarly, if we look at just the upper left corner, we see every number from 0 to 3. And if we were to extend outward to 255 by 255, or more generally, to 2 to the 2 to the n minus 1 by 2 to the 2 to the n minus 1, we would see the same thing. Now that we have a pattern, let's prove it. We'll start with uniqueness. If we had some number x that appeared twice in a row, then we could make a rectangle in our table using two zeros from the top row. But the corners of this rectangle add to zero. And by our definition of nim multiplication, we can't have four corners add to zero. So the numbers can never repeat in any row, or similarly, any column. Now we just need to show that every number appears in each row. To get that, it's helpful to have a simpler way to do this multiplication. Our definition in terms of rectangles is theoretically useful, but it's really cumbersome to actually compute. In order to get one product, we need to fill in every smaller product in the table. Thankfully, there's a more direct way. We can write any number as the sum of powers of 2 using the binary expansion. So, for example, 42 is 32 plus 8 plus 2. And in the same way, we can write any power of 2 as the product of numbers of the form 2 to the 2 to the n, using the binary expansion of the exponent. So 2 to the 42 is 2 to the 32 times 2 to the 8 times 2 to the 2. And these numbers here of the form 2 to the 2 to the n are known as Fermat 2 powers. When we add different powers of 2, we get the same result whether we're using nim addition or regular addition. The only difference is that with nim addition, adding a power of 2 to itself gives us 0. And similarly, when we multiply different Fermat 2 powers, we get the same result with nim multiplication and regular multiplication. The difference is that nim multiplying a 2 power by itself gives us 3 halves times that 2 power. Let's put that together with an example. Let's say we want to multiply 6 by 4. First, we expand the binary to get 4 plus 2 times 4. And then we distribute to get 
4 times 4 plus 2 times 4. And 4 and 2 are Fermat 2 powers, so we can use this rule here. 4 and 4 are the same, so this is 3 halves times 4, which is 6. And 2 and 4 are different, so we multiply them to get 8. And then adding, we get our total of 14. And it can get a little bit more difficult. You may need to expand more than once. So here I've worked a more difficult example. But the key idea here is we can use this rule here to quickly compute multiplications. Notice that if we add powers of 2, we can't ever reach a larger power of 2, since adding two different powers of 2 will always be less than twice the larger. And adding two of the same power of two will always give us zero. And similarly, if we multiply Fermat 2 powers, we can't end up with a larger Fermat 2 power, since if we multiply two different two powers, that will always be less than the larger squared. And if we multiply two of the same, we get three halves times that, which is much smaller still. And any number can be written as the sum of powers of two, which is to say the sum of products of Fermat two powers. So using these two rules and a bit of induction, we can show that if x and y are less than some Fermat two power, then that implies that x times y is also less than that 2 power. And so if we look at any row of the multiplication table, the first 2 to the 2 to the n entries will all be less than 2 to the 2 to the n. And as we said, they'll all be different which means every number must appear in each row and column exactly once. That is, for any number b, there's some other number x, which we can multiply by to get a. Or, said another way, we can divide a by b. If you look closely at the multiplication table, you might notice another line without repeats, this main diagonal. That is, the squares of the numbers are all unique. Why is that? Well, if x squared equals y squared, then with a bit of algebra, you can show x equals y. And so we can't have two different numbers with the same square. And as we saw a moment ago, there's a size limit on multiplication. So there must be the same number of squares and numbers below 2 to the 2 to the n, which means every number must be a square, and the square of something different. And that means we can take square roots. For instance, the square root of 3 is 2, or the square root of 7 is 5, or the square root of 9 is 15. But why stop there? Are there cube roots? Yes, but with a few caveats. First, they're no longer unique. 1 cubed, 2 cubed, and 3 cubed are all 1. And second, there are numbers without cube roots, like 2. Or rather, there are numbers without finite cube roots. Fortunately, we don't need to limit ourselves to the finite. Here we have a grid of cells extending infinitely upward and off to the right. Consider a game in this grid with coins in some of the squares. On each turn, you can move any one coin either somewhere to the left in the same row or anywhere you like in any row below it. What are the Sprague-Grundy values for this game? 
As we've seen in previous games, that's the sum of the values for each individual coin. So we only need to look one coin at a time. If that coin is in the bottom left, there's nowhere for it to go. It can't move left and it can't move down. So there's no legal move and the Sprague Grundy value is zero. And if the coin is here, the only move you can make is to this position with value zero. So this has value one. And it's not too hard to see we get the whole numbers along the bottom row. Okay, now what if the coin starts here? Well, we can move it from here to a position with value zero, so this position can't have value zero. And we can move to value one, so this can't have value one, or two, or three, or any whole number. It has to be something even larger. So let's give that a name, omega. And these cells to the right all have to be larger than that, since they can reach all the whole numbers and also omega. So they're going to have values omega plus 1, omega plus 2, and so on. And these cells up here have to be bigger than everything with 1 omega, so these are going to be 2 omega, 2 omega plus 1, and so on. And these numbers are known collectively as the ordinals, and the ones with omegas in them are called transfinite. There's a lot to say about them, and I've linked some details in the description, but for our purposes, adding them to the numbers is enough to give us cube roots. For example, one of the cube roots of 2 is omega. See if you can find the other two in the comments. Okay, how about fourth roots? Turns out those exist, and once again, they're unique. I'll leave that proof as an exercise. And we could keep going further with fifth and sixth roots and so on, but rather than look at this one case at a time, let's take a step back. Division is really finding a number x that solves a equals bx, or a plus bx is zero. And the square root is really finding a number x that solves a equals x squared, or x squared plus a is zero. And more generally, we might want to ask if there's some number x that solves p of x equals zero for some given polynomial p. And for all non-constant polynomials, the answer is yes. Every polynomial has a solution. In other words, the numbers are an algebraically closed field. And that gives us all sorts of nice properties. Factorization, roots of unity, partial fraction decomposition, everything an algebraist could ever want. This is a good moment to pause and take a look at what we've done. This whole discussion started when we wanted to win a game. And in order to do that, we had to develop some tools, which we then used to form a more general theory of impartial games. So we defined P and N positions, addition of games, and Sprague Grundy values, which we called the numbers. And once we had these numbers, we naturally asked what we could do with them. We found that we could add and subtract, multiply and divide, and if we extended our definition to transfinite ordinals, we could even solve polynomial equations with them. So we found some really deep connections to algebra hidden within the structure of games. And that's how math generally works. We start with some problem that we want to solve, and we keep asking follow-up questions until we find the underlying patterns. And I don't know about you, but I find these sorts of connections really beautiful. In all the games we've analyzed so far in this series, we've made one key assumption. Both players always have the same moves available to them from any position. That is, we've looked at so-called impartial games. But there are plenty of games like chess, where one player can only move the white pieces and one player can only move the black, where that assumption doesn't hold. And if we remove that restriction, 
and analyze what are known as partisan games, we get a totally different structure. In fact, we can create an entirely separate number system from them. So join me next time as we look at the surreals. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.